to the first of our series, Science, Technology, and Society Lectures. This year, the College uh, Thematic Lecture Series will examine the myriad ways science and technology are influencing how we see nature and culture, society, and history. Upcoming Science, Technology, and Society Lectures will include presentations by Rebecca Sklut, Roy Bauermeister, Lydia Villa Kamaroff, Simon LeVay, and in the spring term, Michael uh, Pollan. At this time, uh, it's my pleasure to ask that Linda Krauss, Associate Professor of Computer Science and Information Systems, please come forward to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you again for being with us. Good evening. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Maria Clave. Uh, let me begin by telling you a little bit about her. Dr. Clave began her tenure in 2006 as Harvey Mudd College's fifth president. A renowned computer scientist and scholar, President Clave is the first woman to lead the college since its founding in 1955. Prior to joining Harvey Mudd College, she served as Dean of Engineering and Professor of Computer Science at Princeton University. Dr. Clave has made significant research contributions in several areas of mathematics and computer science, her current research focuses on discrete mathematics. Dr. Clave is one of the 10 members of the board of Microsoft Corporation, a board member of Broadman Corporation and the nonprofit Math for America, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a trustee for the Mathematical Sciences Research Institute in Berkeley, and a member of both the Stanford Engineering Advisory Council and Advisory Council for the Computer Science Teachers Association. Over the years, she's received numerous awards and honorary doctorates from a number of distinguished universities. When Dr. Kave became president of Harvey Mudd College, she was dismayed to find that the percentage of female computer science graduates from the college was stuck in single digits. She has since turned that figure around dramatically, and in 2012, more than 40% of Harvey Mudd's computer science degrees went to women. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Clave. Well, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here with you today, and I have really enjoyed having a chance to get to know the president, uh, several members of the faculty, and several students and staff during the day. And I'm particularly proud that we have uh, on the faculty, out of 150 faculty members at Elmhurst, we have three, count them, three students who attended Harvard Mudd College. We refer to students who have attended Harvard Mudd College as mutters. You can just imagine we have these pins that we hand out to parents and, and siblings, a mother's mutter, mother's fodder, <laughs> mother's brother, etc. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what happened at Harvey My College in terms of increasing the number of women computer science majors. Now, um, the first thing I have to make really clear is I can take zero, that was zero credit for this. It was all done by our computer science faculty. And the only thing that I did to help was occasionally I came up with small sums of money when they needed some money to do something. 
So um, this is definitely an example of a group, of, a small group of faculty deciding that they wanted to understand what was causing a problem, doing a fair amount of research about what had been done at other institutions uh, to recruit more women in computer science, then over a number of years implementing some different approaches, evaluating whether they work, and in the end, um, they, we have ended up being um, having the highest percentage of CS majors who are female in the country, and I would guess in North America. But well, actually, that's not quite true. Bryn Moore has a computer science major. <laughs> and it is 100% female, but that is a little too much. So, um, the first thing I want to talk about is why are there so few women in computer science? So, it's actually pretty easy to understand. In our country, um, in fact, in pretty much all of North America, which is not necessarily true in some other parts of the world, we encourage our young people to study something that they're passionate about, to major in something they'll be good at. And what we know from many, many studies over the last 20 years is that young women think that computer science is something that is boring. Boring! Something that boys are good at and girls aren't good at. And so it's not surprising that the vast majority of young women, when they um, enter college, they choose to major in something else. After all, why would they pick something that they think they're not good at and that they think they wouldn't enjoy? But it's also true that even for the women that enter computer science, a disproportionately large number of them leave before completing a degree. So why is that? I think there's really two things. The first thing is feeling a lack of confidence, and the second is feeling a lack of sense of belonging. So before I get into the Harvey My College story, I want to talk a little bit about the imposter syndrome. Raise your hand if you've heard about the imposter syndrome. Okay? All right, so that means probably about three quarters have. So the imposter syndrome is something that is experienced by both men and women and it's experienced by people at all stages of their career, but it seems to be have a disproportionately heavy impact on women in fields where they're underrepresented, like, for example, computer science, physics, and many areas of engineering. So what the imposter syndrome is, is you seem to all um, outward appearances to be having a highly successful experience. So maybe you're a student and you're getting A's in your classes, Maybe you're the president of a college who is on a whole bunch of prestigious boards. But deep inside yourself, you sort of think, I don't think I'm really as talented or successful as people think. They're going to find out I'm a fraud sooner or later. So raise your hand if you ever feel this way about your own situation. It's pretty common, yes, the vast majority of hands go up. <laughs> But the problem is that not enough people actually talk about it. So let's suppose you're a young woman who's in majoring in computer science, and you know only 10% of your class is female, or maybe 15% if you're lucky. And you've been getting A's, and all of a sudden you get a B minus. Well, if you suspected that you didn't really belong there in the first place, that B or B minus or even a B plus, you go like, oh my goodness, I always knew I wasn't meant for this. And there's a guy right beside you in your class who's got nothing but C's and C pluses for the entire year, and he is telling himself he rocks at this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and there's just lots of examples, lots of studies that have been done that if you take a group of men and women whatever stage in their career or studies, and if they're, and you've selected them so that their performance is essentially identical, the men perceive that they're doing much better than they actually are, and the women perceive that they're doing less well than they actually are. And I have no idea why this is. It doesn't really matter why it is. But the thing it tells us is that for us to get more women into areas like computer science that are underrepresented and to keep them there, 
we have to address that sense of belonging, that sense of confidence, and we need to pay special attention to it. Now, one more thing before I start talking about Harvey Mudd. Um, you might say, who cares that so few females are going into computer science? Why does it matter? And computer science, it turns out, is the only discipline in science and engineering where participation by females has declined and significantly declined in the last 30 years. Every other discipline has increased significantly over, the participation of women has increased significantly over the last 30 years. So for example, um, around the time when I started in mathematics, probably the percentage of women getting uh, PhDs in mathematics was under 5%. By the time I got my PhD, it was like 9%. Um, now it's 30% of the PhDs go to, to women. PhDs in mathematics go to women. And so there's been a steady growth upwards. 30 years ago in computer science, about 35% of the CS majors were female. Today, it tends to run between 10 and 14%. So, okay, the numbers have declined, but does it matter? So let me argue why it matters. I think there are three reasons. Um, I'll start with, um, I mean, all of them are important, but they're important at sort of different scales. So one is that there is more demand for computer science graduates today than there ever has been, and it's going to continue to increase. And I mean, the salaries are just skyrocketing uh, for college graduates, for people who are five years out, for people who are 15 years out. There's just so much demand, and it's partly because the tech industry is growing. But more importantly, it's because applications of computer science are becoming important in every single area of society, whether we're talking about healthcare, or about education, or about mus the music industry, or the entertainment industry. Computer science degrees are increasingly recruited by every single area, and there just aren't enough to go around. So, you know, one thing that many people say, and I actually believe it's true, that if when we think about the economic future of this country, it is largely dependent on our being able to attract more young women and young men to major in computer science. I mean, you'll often heard it about, hear this uh, generally phrased as more people into STEM degrees, but the truth of the matter is we graduate way more biologists and chemists than the economy can absorb, and we don't graduate enough computer scientists, mathematicians, and some areas of engineering for the economy. Okay, so that's one about the economic future. The second one is about the quality of what actually gets developed in our society. If you have a group of people working on a product or a solution to a particular problem, and if they all come with a similar mindset and set of experiences, I can guarantee that the solutions you get are much less good than if you have people that bring a diverse set of perspectives and a diverse set of experiences to that. And you know, I, I'm very lucky at Harvard My College to have a wonderful senior team of vice presidents. On that team, I explicitly want to select for people who have a very different perspective, style, for me. I want them to have similar values. I, mean, I love the Harvard Mudd College mission. I want them to believe in the mission. But if they were all like me, they would add no benefit to the decision making that goes on at the college. And it's exactly the same when we think about product design or problem solving. If you have people who are all nerdy geeks who only play certain kinds of video and computer games and have no social skills, I can guarantee that the solutions will not be as good as having some of those, some people who are social butterflies, some people who want to change the world and feed starving children in Africa, some musicians, some artists, etc. Okay, so attracting a more diverse group of people, whether it's poets or football players or young women, to a field like computer science is extremely important and even more important because it has so much impact all kinds of different areas of our society. And then the final reason that, to me, that it's important to attract young women into computer science careers. These are awesome careers. They 
offer enough, enormous amount of flexibility if you want to combine being a mother as well as having an ambitious career. They pay incredibly well. So the going rates, apparently in the Chicago area, for a grad in computer, BSc in computer science, fresh grad, is 60 to 65,000 per year. In Silicon Valley, it's about 85 to 90,000 per year. I mean, and that's just your starting salary. I mean, my son, who has a master's degree, started out right after he got his master's at 65K. Within three years, it was $300,000. I'm sorry to say he actually quit his job because he saved so much money and now he's designing a computer game living in Vancouver and having the time of his life. He does know he'll have to work again sooner or later. But, you know, if he earns $3,000 a year, he can work one year and take four years off. Okay, so that's why it matters. Now, uh, when I arrived at my, about 10% of our CS majors were female. Now, we we're a very small place. I mean, Elmhurst, I gather, is somewhat small, but it's humongous compared to mine. We have 750 students and 85 faculty. Well, maybe not humongous, but larger. And um, we typically had uh, roughly 25 to 30 students graduating each year with a computer science degree, and two or three on an incredible year, four of those students would be female. So, Just to tell you a little bit about this place, which I already did, we're undergraduate only. As I already mentioned, we're small. Um, we have seven departments. One of them is humanities, social sciences, and the arts all together. And then we have an engineering department, so it's a general engineering program. And then we have um, five other science departments, so math, physics, chemistry, biology, and computer science. Um, we only have majors in science and engineering. We are the science and engineering college of the Claremont Colleges, which have five undergraduate colleges. They're sort of a jigsaw puzzle, they're contiguous. A total of about 5,000 undergraduate students among the five, and then two graduate institutions with a couple thousand graduate students. Um, we have, uh, as I said, a broad and deep core that students take in their first three semesters. So you don't choose your major until your sophomore year. You can wait till the very last day of your sophomore year before picking your major. You are all going to take a ton of math, physics, chemistry, and then some computer science, engineering, biology, as well as a ton of humanities, social sciences, and the arts. Okay? And one of the things about this is it means that even though we may have many students who never expected, didn't, hated computers, thought they would never touch computer science as a discipline when they arrive, they get exposed to it. So in the first semester, Every student takes a computer science course. And I can tell you that um, it used to be the most despised required course in the first semester. <laughs> Did you like it, Victoria? Um, it was fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, you're not telling me it was your best course in your first semester. No. Probably special relativity if they were still doing that in your first semester. I, I appreciate it. So, um, how do we get from 10% to 40%? And, and I'll say, this actually happened over three years. I mean, I'm telling the story six years later, but it took three years for it to happen, and then we kept it there. So, I thought I'd give you a little bit of statistics about um, females at Harvey Mudd um, over time. So, if we look back in 1997, it was about 20%. And by the time I arrived as president in 2006, it had increased to low 30%. And by 2010, we were at 42%. Our entry, our entry class that year was 51.5% female, first time ever, over 50%. And uh, our entry class this year was 47.5% female, and we're roughly overall some ways between 45% and 50%. So, big change over a relatively small period of time. But the other thing that happened over this period of time was the increase in the female faculty. So I'm guessing it was about 20% in 1997. That might be an overestimate. By the time I arrived in 2006, 
it had increased to 35%. Now, just to give you some context, MIT, so the places we compete for for students, MIT, Caltech, Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Cornell, something like that. CMU sometimes now too. Um, MIT celebrated when it passed 15% female faculty a few years ago. I'm not sure it's gotten any further. Caltech covers around 10%, 11%, 9% female faculty. Uh, Princeton Engineering, while I was in there, we managed to get to 15% female faculty, and we really celebrated. So 35% um, is incredible, and I just want to point out, I mean, you can see that the president before me, who was there from 1997 to 2006, John Strauss, he really had a huge role in addressing gender at the college. And so I feel very grateful for that because I'm the first female president and it would have been hard if I were the first person to start talking about gender issues at MUD. And he had really, he really played a huge leadership role and I'm deeply grateful. He did other great things too, but it's not the only thing. Um, we were up to 42% in 2010 female faculty. And I just noticed uh, when I made these slides, which was a little while ago, of the faculty who got tenure in 2011, four of the five were female, and of the five that were recruited in 2011, four of the five were female. So let me talk about what the computer science department did. And this was, our computer science department has 10 people in it. Um, the work on what was done was basically done by four individuals. So they did uh, a number of things. First, they changed the intro class. They also limit, eliminated what I refer to as student natural behavior, and I'll define that for you in a moment. They started taking our first year female students, not, I mean, we don't know what people are gonna major in, so we just offered every incoming female student the opportunity to go to the race for the celebration of women in computing, uh, which, just in case you're interested and you want to go, it's October 3rd through 6th in Baltimore, pretty close to Chicago. And we provided summer research experiences between the first and the second year for eight to 10 females. Um, so let me talk about the match of behavior. One of the things that happens is that um, students in high school who are really interested in computer science don't often have a computer science teacher who knows much about it. Because if you have an education in computer science, you're gonna have access to all kinds of really well-paid jobs that are a lot less work than being a teacher in high school. Well, it might be, well, I shouldn't say that, but are less stressful than being a teacher in high school. And um, so what happens to these almost always young men who are just passionate about computer science and they've been trying to teach themselves since they were eight, or 11, two, whatever. They get into their first computer science class in college and they see, oh my God, that's a real computer scientist. I can talk to this person about all these things I've been wanting to talk to people about for decades. Well, let's say 10 years. And so what do they do? They just can't stop talking about all the things they've done in computer science. And what happens is that all the other students in this class are sitting there listening to this and going like, oh my god, I don't belong here. I mean, so other people in this class know so much more than I do. I mean, I just better get out of this class. I have no way I'm going to survive this. But we call that macho behavior because um, it's not meant as macho by the all souls male students that do it. They're just excited and passionate about a discipline, but it's experienced as macho behavior by the others in the classroom. And it scares people like crazy. So one of the things our department of faculty did was they just addressed this by, um, by doing a couple of things. They streamed the course so that they would have a section for people with no prior experience, some prior experience, and a lot of prior experience. And then in each of those sections, since you know, obviously people don't clump quite that accurately, when they ran into this kind of behavior, the instructor would talk to the student or two who's behaving like this, <coughs> and say something like, Alan, I'm so glad to have you in my class. You're so knowledgeable and so passionate about it, and I love talking to you about what you know. I'm sure you don't understand that 
However, the, a lot of students are intimidated by just how much you know. So if we could just keep it between the two of us, and we can talk outside of class, but just in private, it'd be much better for everyone else. And it works. Because you're not being nasty to the student, you're celebrating the fact that they're so excited about the discipline. So let me talk about a change in the intro course. The old course was a pretty traditional, well-taught course about learning to program in Java. And it was loved by the kids who were passionate about computer science already, and it was the most hated course in the first semester before I arrived. The new course is a team-based computational approaches to problem solving using Python. So Python is this programming language that uh, <clears throat> has two advantages. One, it's um, relatively forgiving, relatively easy to program in compared to Java. And secondly, it's actually used in industry. So if you take your first course learning programming in Java, you're going to be able to get a summer job. Whereas if you took your first course learning programming in Alice, that probably, there are not many summer jobs except developing Alice. In Alice. Um, we made it much more team-based, and um, but the most important part of all is, this course is not about learning to program. They're doing just as much programming. They didn't know how to program before they started. So of course they learned to program. And it covers all the same conceptual material that the old, old, coast, old course covered, but it is framed in a different way. It is framed as you're learning to solve problems, mostly in science and engineering, using this tool. And one of the things we know about women and underrepresented minorities is the interesting part about computers is what you can do with them. Not the computers themselves, but all the great things you can actually do. And so it went from being the most despised course to absolutely the most loved course in the first semester in one year. That's why it only took three years, because we put it in the first year. I mean, I, and I had, again, nothing to do with this. The CS department did it. They also, you know, because it was so popular, a lot of students went on to take the second course. And then a lot of those students went on to take the third course in the third semester. And none of those, most of those students, especially the female students, they did not think they were going to major in computer science. They were just taking it because, first of all, it was so much fun. And secondly, they realized after, you know, taking the second or third course, they could get great summer jobs. And so by the time they'd gone through the third course, it's sort of like, well, I guess I could major in this. I'm doing really well in it. I like it. There are great jobs out there. Why wouldn't I? So I already mentioned grouping by experience. So um, our colors are black and gold or white. Um, CS5 gold, this is Lou's, colors are carefully chosen. CS5 gold is for people with no programming experience. Black is for those with programming experience. And then um, we have some number of students, usually about 30 out of 200 that come in each year, that have really taken a year's worth of college level computer science. And so, we had to come up with a number for a course that would be, this course is going to combine both the introductory, which is CS5, and CS60. And if you had to pick a number between 5 and 60, <laughs> Carol, it ought to be 42. <laughs> so what has happened is, everybody loves this course. So one of the great joys I have as being president of a tiny, tiny institution is that I get to meet all first year students each year. And for some reason, I guess because they're all taking the same classes, they travel in clumps. Now, like sort of like six to 15 at a time. And MUD is a long linear campus. At one end are the residences, which is also where the president's house is. And I often say it's very good that my husband and I are so quite deaf. Because <laughs> MUD, MUDers have great parties. At the other end is the academic end of the and then there are these two sidewalks with grass and all in between them. And everybody walks back and forth along those sidewalks because, you know, you have to go over here to class and then come back to get stuff, and the dining hall and, and student center is in the middle along this long line. So it's pretty easy for 
anyone who wants to, to find pretty much all the students right, within a few days. You just walk backwards and forwards. And, and so my favorite thing is I'll stop a clump of students and I'll say, uh, okay, I'm going to do my survey. And I usually do it about three weeks into the semester and then again about six weeks into the semester. And I go, hey, what's your favorite course this semester? And if I'm going around 10 people, I'll get, I'll typically get, oh, I hate computers, but I love CS5. And this person will go, yeah, CS5 is awesome. This person will go, yeah, CS5. And this person will go, well, my math class is really good, but CS5 is good too. And then the next person will go special rel, and special relativity, which is like first half semester of physics. It's totally awesome, but I love CS5. And then I'll get, all the rest will just do CS5. And, you know, it's just, and so many of them are going, I thought I hated computers, but CS5 is just the most fun experience. So what happens is, not only did we get more women, we doubled the number of majors. So now we have typically up to 50 majors a year, but we also have a ton of the non-majors taking more CS classes. So um, CS70, which is the third course in the sequence, we have very strange number. Um, used to run with, say, 11 to 18 students in the section. One section each semester. So for this fall, they had 80 students registered in CS70. But that was before the students who needed it for their major needed to enroll in it. And so the vast majority of students graduating from my today, as well as a number of the students from other campuses, are taking more computer science. And it's all because first course, then the second course, then the third course became really a lot of fun. Hard work. None of our courses are easy. I can absolutely guarantee that. I think our curriculum is genuinely more challenging than Caltech or MIT. They're probably not more challenging than them put together. Um, but it's just been a wonderful experience. So let me tell you about taking first year females to Hopper. So um, the the person who really, I think, was the catalyst for everything that happened was a young assistant professor who finished her PhD at MIT um, and joined Harvey Mudd College as an assistant professor the year before I arrived. Now, Christine did her undergraduate at Dartmouth and had a wonderful experience. They have a very strong CS program there. And, you know, felt like she was embraced and nourished and never felt like she was treated any different because she was female. And then she went to MIT. And, you know, there are some great, wonderful, supportive people in MIT, computer science. But there are a bunch of jerks, including among the graduate students and the faculty. I mean, who just think that one of the ways to get the best work out of people is to challenge them and undermine their confidence. Wrong. You get your best work out of people by Yes, challenging them, but by supporting their confidence and setting high expectations for them, providing lots of support and inspiration. She was very angry about how the other students and some of the faculty in artificial intelligence at MIT made her feel. And so when she arrived at MUD and saw this, you know, like 10% female, she just went, I'm going to do something about this. Now, typically, it's not your arriving new assistant professor who changes the world at a college. Sometimes it is. Well, um, she didn't do it alone by any means. Uh, she had three other male faculty who really were, were wonderful collaborators on this. But she was, I think, the leader. And she was certainly the person who thought about taking the first year female students to Hopper. So let me tell you about Hopper. Has anyone here been to Hopper? President Ray, this would be good for you, <laughs> as well as everyone else in the audience. So the Hopper Conference was started. So Grace Murray Hopper was one of the early uh, leaders in computing. She was one of the programmers who programmed uh, some of the first computers during World War II, doing calculations for uh, missiles. She was one of the inventors of the Cobalt language. She was a an admiral in the Navy for during her career. And um, so, and she died, I'm trying to think, she died in the early 80s, I think. I actually got to meet her, I think, in 1978. Um, in 
1994, a new conference was founded, started by uh, two computer scientists, uh, Anita Borg and Telly Whitney. Anita Borg was working at, um, there used to be a digital, a company called Digital Equipment. They had a number of research labs, she was at one of them, and Telly was working uh, as a, uh, a hardware architect uh, for another company. And they decided that there should be a conference that celebrates the contributions of women to computer science. Not a conference that complains about how few women there are, but a conference that celebrates that, in fact, there are women doing well in computer science. And so the first conference was held in DC. There were 453 attendees. Three were male. And um, there were a bunch of keynote speakers. And I remember, so I was one of the speakers at that conference, and I remember arriving in the hotel. And um, so I dressed up for you guys tonight. So I, don't, I do not usually look like this. <laughs> yeah, typical gear for computer scientists are t-shirt and jeans. Oh, maybe in the years when cords are in, t-shirt and cords, running shoes, maybe a shirt if you're dressing up with your jeans, but you know. And the most amazing thing for me was standing in the hotel lobby here were all these women that were obviously female computer scientists. They, we, I mean, we also always carry backpacks because we have our laptops in them, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, it was just incredible. And just the experience of being in a room with 450 technical women, it's absolutely transformational. And the conference was a big success, and the idea was that the conference would happen every three years it did for a while, and then it happened every two years, and Anita unfortunately died of brain cancer at the age of 54 in 2003, um, and, um, but she had started by then a, an organization called the Institute for Women in Technology, which after, uh, after her death was renamed the Anita Borg Institute, which still runs the conference. Telly Whitney and, and I were Anita's best friends. I was her best friend on the academic side, Telly was her best friend on the industry side, barely knew each other. When Anita became too ill to lead the Institute for Women in Technology, Tally took over at the, as the interim CEO. And then I had been on the board of trustees since the, since the founding of the Institute. And when we asked Tally to continue as the permanent CEO, Tally basically said, Maria, I'll do it if you will chair the board. Well, I at that time was um, juggling um, moving to Princeton as Dean of Engineering, plus being president of the Association of Computing Machinery, which is the major CS professional organization, what could I possibly say? I said yes. And as um, and so Telly and I, uh, we made, because we were losing Anita, which Anita was one of the most passionate, visionary people I ever met. She just, totally joyful person. And because we were losing her, I, we just sort of, we said, we'll become each other's best friend. And we will each take up all the parts of Anita that are disappearing because she's dying. So I got the kayaking, Telly got the fancy dresses and high heels. Um, I cannot wear high heels. So anyway, Christine's idea, by this time the Hopper Conference had become an annual conference, and she said, and, and by this time it was more like 1,200 people instead of 450, and now it's like 3,000. She said, you know, the young women who come to MUD, they're going to major in science and engineering. And no matter what the area they choose, they'll be so much better off if they get to see how many successful women there are in te technology careers. So um, her first year, we took 12. Um, and what happens now is that we send out an invitation to all our incoming first year females in the summer. This allows us to schedule labs so that we'll minimize the lost time. And we know that the experience of attending the conference is going to be valuable independent of the planned major. Now, a few years ago, Hopper started recognizing the college and university that had the most students in attendance. And for several years, we were number two. So, for instance, when we were in Tucson, we were number two behind the University of Arizona. When we were um, in Atlanta, we were number two behind Georgia Tech. Last year, we were number one, even though it was in Portland. And this year, we're number one, even though it's in Baltimore. We're taking 50 students, so 40, I believe 42 first year females um, and um, eight upper class students as mentors. 
And, and the thing I'll tell you that, you know, the president spent a lot of time fundraising for the institution. And of all the things I've ever raised funds for, this is the easiest thing to get money for. Because the tech industry really wants more graduates in computer science. And they have seen the success of attending Hopper in encouraging the retention of, of women in the major. So what comes out of this? Um, we've done lots of studies, not me of course, but our CS faculty, really trying to evaluate what the impact of all the things we changed should be. And the thing we got out of, of Hopper was uh, it really inspires our students. <coughs> it gives them a sense that there can be critical mass. Uh, makes them very aware of job opportunities because it's great recruiting for the tech companies that come and try to hire people as summer interns. And um, it provides access to role models. So, summer research experience. Um, the hardest time to get a research experience or an internship for an undergraduate student is between their first and second year because they've had fewer courses. And so we just decided that if we gave these students an opportunity to do research, there's lots of research that says that being involved in research increases retention for students and other, for females and other underrepresented minorities. And what we found was that they found it highly motivating, it built their confidence and sense of belonging. And you remember that's one of the issues for women in areas like CS and engineering. But of course it creates a connection with a faculty member and with the research group. So, you know, usually about this time in the talk, people are saying, oh, well that's all very well for much. I mean, first of all, there's science and engineering school, so everybody who comes to MUD is going to be in some area, so it's going to be way easier to recruit females, um, since they're already going to do science and engineering, and everybody has to take a computer science course in the first semester, and very few places have that kind of requirement. Well, there are things that people can do anywhere. First of all, you can make your introductory courses the most fun ever. It did not cost more money. It was not more difficult to teach. It just required a change in attitude about what you were doing. And it is not expensive to eliminate macho behavior. I mean, I know you're a small college, so you don't have classes with 200 students in them, I think. Um, but even for places that have classes with 200 students, usually they have smaller sections with TAs. And so it can be the TA who's talking to the student exhibiting macho behavior. We all know how to deal confidence, team projects, assignments, and labs. And the single thing that I think is probably most important is simply to encourage. Just, I, I mean, it sounds ridiculous. It is so easy to do. But just when you see a student who's having some doubts, I met at least one today who was doubting um, whether how good she was in math because she had a difficult experience in algebra and also calculus last year. Encouraging them to believe that if you stick it out, if you work at it, that you actually can succeed is very important. You can all take your students to Hopper, especially given that nobody in the audience has ever been. But you can also do something local that has really worked well. So uh, one of my, uh, I said my first PhD uh, recipient, Corey Penn Quinn, came up with an idea a couple of years ago about holding an imposter panel. So her idea at Hopper, and it happened actually in the Colorado Hopper, so now I can't remember which year that was. Um, Corey's idea was this. Let's pick five women computer scientists who everyone sees as being highly successful at different stages of their careers, but you know, someone who's the up and coming star, somebody who's the gray or very gray star, whatever. And every single one of them is going to explain what makes them feel like an imposter, and how they cope with it. And I have to tell you, this was like the most successful ever Hopper panel. It was, it's not just that every single seat was taken and every inch of the floor, but there were people in the hallway craning there, and you could just see this row of heads <laughs> watching it. And there's nothing as empowering for a woman at any stage in her career who's feeling like she's the only one doubts herself, to suddenly realize that all these people, all these role models that she thought felt so successful, have exactly the same doubts day in, day out. Um, you can offer your females and your male students summer research experiences, and I've been hearing a bit about the first 
your seminar program and how our, for students in science and engineering it's going to uh, engage students in a research experience in uh, their second semester, which I think is great. Another thing that worked, I mean, so um, I actually worked on this issue with a team of people at the University of British Columbia for a number of years, and um, we didn't have a required computer science course in the first semester. And, um, and most of the students in the Faculty of Science were majoring in biology and chemistry. Most of the female students, actually most of all students, but particularly female students, were majoring in biology and chemistry, and they thought they were going to be doctors. Now, typically we have 1,500 students in an incoming class. 900 thought they were going to be doctors. Of those 900, 80 might get into med school. So that leaves you with 820 very dissatisfied students who graduate in biology and chemistry at the end of four years. Not a good situation. So um, we did two things, uh, both of which can be done here. And I was asking uh, Professor Krauss about the number of female CS majors. And I gather it's, it's sort of like the way it was at MUD at this point. And, but computer science is not a required course for all students. So I told her what we did at UBC. We did two things that made a huge difference. The very first one was we got a sentence in the handbook for incoming first-year students that simply said, the Dean of Science advises that all science majors, independent of major, take a computer science course because you will find it helpful no matter what you major in. All of a sudden, our courses went, our intro courses went from being like 22 to 25%, 28% female to 40 instantly. Why? Female students read handbooks and they take advice. <laughs> and you know, I would be standing with students at the orientation, I would say, so what are you signing up for? And they'd say, well, I'm doing this, this, and computer science. And I'd say, why are you taking computer science? And they'd say, because it said so in the handbook. <laughs> this is so trivial. I mean, it's just so, I mean, you guys can definitely do that. It will make a big difference. The other one is, you know, most students majoring in areas like biology, chemistry, and psychology, first of all, are female. And secondly, they don't realize that having some computer science is going to be incredibly helpful in that discipline if you end up going to grad school. It's even going to be helpful if you end up getting a job. And so one of the things we did was we had our faculty that taught chemistry, biology, psychology, et cetera tell their classes, their introductory classes in the first year, by the way, we think it would be helpful in your degree in X if you take some computer science courses. And on top of that, what UBC did was, I mean, it was already in existence, so UBC has very strong co-op programs, which means that we run a number of courses in the summer because we have students going out on co-op work terms every semester. And so it was possible to take all three of the first three computer science courses in one summer. So you could do your first year as a biology major, or even your first two years as a biology major, and then take enough computer science the summer before your junior year that you could graduate with a double major in computer science and biology in four years. And you know, so now if you look at UBC, 40% um, of the double majors in biology and CS about 33% of all double majors that involve CS are female. And between 22 and 25% of the just CS majors are female. Um, across Canada, it's roughly about 12% of CS majors are female. So it makes a difference. So I would be delighted to answer questions. Um, and I just want to say again, what a pleasure it is being here. Question. Um, the microphone over there, but then I'm out here. I'll be coming up the east center aisle. Here comes the center. Or raise your hands. You. So, for high school students, does Harvey want to do anything to um, bring high school students on campus and encourage them and so forth? It's a wonderful question. Um, so the answer is, uh, before I got there, mostly no. Um, MIT 
does high school programs, Caltech does high school programs, but we weren't for the most part doing it. And we have started, um, so one of the things we're trying to do right now is reach out to groups that are truly underrepresented in science and engineering programs. And so we have been, in collaboration with Claremont Graduate University, we have been running a math camp for African American boys from the Long Beach area for the last two summers. Um, I think we're going to transition this actually to a program for African American boys from the greater um, Southern California region. And we're starting uh, an engineering summer camp that will be engineering uh, math and physics, well, engineering math, physics, and computer science for girls of color from the greater Los Angeles area. And hopefully, we'll be launching that next summer. So we're starting. Um, when you're as small as we are, um, it's, you know, we also run something called the Homework Hotline, which is a, a similar to something that's uh, run by Rose Hallman uh, in Indiana, which uh, coaches students on math science homework from fourth grade to twelfth grade um, throughout the school year. Um, and we do a number of other kinds of things. But um, rather than run sort of a, a, the kind of gifted programs for gifted and talented youth, that John Hopkins runs that's aimed at a broader range of, of people. We're trying to offer our summer programs to groups that are very <coughs> underrepresented in science and engineering as part of, you know, we try to take on problems that we think are really hard to solve, try to figure out what works, and then disseminate that and share that with others. Someone behind you. I don't know, I don't know if I need the mic. So I work for Twitter and I actually run our women in engineering group and I wonder what you we as like an industry company can do to make ourselves attractive to female like computer science majors and So I so that's a, a great question. Um, so the question is um, we have with us somebody who works for Twitter and she's interested in knowing how um, how they could make themselves attractive to recruiting females. So so the first thing I want to say is um, I've seen over and over again that our female graduates are more likely to choose larger companies than smaller companies. And I, you know, I hate to say this, but my feeling, especially startups, and Twitter is not really a startup, but it's, it, you know, they're more likely to go to a Microsoft than a Facebook, um, which, which I find very interesting. And I, th I think it's, I mean, I just hate to say this, but I feel like females tend to be risk, more risk averse particularly in starting out their career. And so they're more likely to go to a place that has been around for quite a while and they think is going to be there. So but that didn't ask to answer your question. So in terms of answering your question, if I were trying to attract female students um, and female grads who would like to go to Twitter or from any place else, the first thing I would do is I would start a fabulous summer internship program where you take students at the end of their first year. And you know, a lot of places don't do it because they think those students can't really contribute. But I can guarantee you, you hire any MUD student after their first year who did reasonably well on CS5 and CS60, they will blow your socks off. <laughs> um, I mean, they're just amazing. Um, so, and I, I would not make it all female because my sense is that our female students are, they feel there's a stigma to going to an all female program but I would make it 50-50. Yeah, we had one out of 60 in the entire this past summer. Though. One out of 60? Yeah, 60. One out of 60. One out of 60, okay. So, so I can help you because, um, I mean, I know that the situation about getting internships after your first year, even at MUD, is relatively hard. And so I, if you're interested in doing this, we could get you five. Okay. I mean, and all you would have to do is uh, you basically send us a description of what you're looking for. We advertise it probably around November, and um, which is a great time to be recruiting people. By November, we know how well they're doing in CS5, or they might be in, you know, even in 42. And uh, and so we have Intel doing this. We have, um, you know, a lot of companies aiming at this because the thing is, if they have a great experience their first year, they tell all the other students about it. So not only do you get them, maybe get some of them back, but you get even more students the next year. And as you know, the best way to actually get somebody to come and work for you 
is to have them have a great experience as an intern and then want to get a job offer, you know, September, October of their senior year. So I guarantee it will work. What would you say is the demand to be a computer science major or just computer science in general? In terms of how many people want to do it or how many people want to hire those people? Both. Let's go okay. both. So we have seen the demand in terms of the size of our major has doubled over the last, I mean the number of students majoring in computer science has doubled over the last five years. And, you know, I would say, I look at Berkeley, I look at Stanford, at MIT, and so on, um, they're all seeing growth in their CS major. And for our graduates, they get as many offers as they're willing to go for interviews. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just ridiculous. When we ended up having, so we have 170 students, 75 students in a graduating year. We will have like 110 employers interviewing. I mean, it's just nuts. So um, there's just a huge need for more people who do computer science. And I would say, uh, I mean, there are a number of options here that you can do information systems, you can do um, a gaming, computer gaming, um, you can do an information technology certificate, I think, something like that. But my first recommendation would be do computer science because it will give you the deepest, um, I think, most flexible education in terms of what what you can do afterwards. I mean, it's not that the others aren't good, they're all good, but that will be, you know, if you want to have the maximum possibilities, I uh, made a comment about, uh, generally about high school computer science classes. And I'm wondering if you think that there's value in encouraging both more girls and boys to take the high school computer science classes or not? So um, one of the things that's been going on uh, is that the number of teachers teaching computer science in high school has dropped significantly. And the number of, and I think this is mostly because of the demand for the job market. And the number of students taking AP computer science has dropped dramatically. And moreover, and I think part of the reason for that is that a lot of the top universities will not accept AP CS as you know, allowing you to place out of the introductory class. So there's a big initiative that's led by the National Science Foundation right now, Jan Cooney and the Computer and Information Systems Engineering Division, um, to get, to train more high school computer science teachers. And there's also an initiative to completely revise the AP computer science course so that it will be one that the vast majority of top departments will accept to place out of the introductory course. So, you know, at some places, computer science in high school is little more than web development, HTML. It's not a bad thing to take, but it's probably not, it doesn't have as much substance as the math or physics or chemistry or statistics courses have. So if it's a good course, um, and I think the new AP computer science course will be an excellent course, I would highly recommend taking it. The, but, you know, really the issue is how we're gonna get those many more excellent computer science teachers into the schools, particularly given the budget situation right now where so few places are hiring. So I think it's, we're sort of in catch 22 right now. Yes, students should be taking them, but there aren't, there's not a lot of access. There are a lot of high schools with no computer science at all. I should mention, however, though, that there's an increasing effort uh, by organizations to provide resources for after school computer science classes so that when kids want to teach themselves, they have a chance to do it. And a couple of those are Skills Crush and Code Academy. Sort of going uh, off of that comment, what do you do about um, the job of being AP, the, the language dependency in Python? Just a practical yeah. question. And I have another question. Yeah, so I mean, I often talk about, so I'm, as was mentioned, I'm on the advisory board of the CSTA, Computer Science Teachers Association, and was actually president of ACM when ACM founded it, so, you know, it's, it's something that I care about a lot. And I often talk about the fact that, you know, CS teachers are, are just, they're some of the worst treated teachers in the world because AP, you know, first of all, it used to be, um, what was the programming language 
that started with P, that Pascal, thank you. It used to be Pascal, and then they decided to make it C++. Okay, so all of these teachers had to retrain, learn a completely different language, and they did. And five years later, they changed it to Java. I mean, it's just like insane. And you know, I don't know why this happened. Um, C++ would be just fine to just leave it there. Even Pascal was not so bad. Um, I suspect they're going to move away from Java for the gold standard, but even if they're not going to move away from it, it's going to be much less about programming and much more about computer science. So, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm not giving you a very good answer, but you know, I feel terrible for the computer science teacher community, just given the kinds of um, contortionist things that are being done to them by the AP. Um, sort of on the same, but well, how much do you do in terms of uh, parallel programming, or does your computer science department do? I know at Six C they're always pushing. Um, you know, Intel's there having several sessions yeah. talking about introduce it as soon as possible. Yeah, do they do that. Okay, CS5. so so let let me um, let me explain the question that's being asked here. So um, uh, as I think probably all of you know that over the last 20 years, or longer than that actually, computer chips have, becoming, be, have become coming smaller and faster. And at some point, there's sort of a physical limit. And so what happened is that the, the computers, what's inside your computer today, rather than being one sort of computing machine, actually has two or four or five or 16 of those computing cores. And uh, so one of the things that's very hard to do is to take code that was used to running on one of those cores and now have it effectively use four or 16 or eight. <coughs> and so uh, what's being raised here is the idea that Intel, which is obviously one of the, the largest designer of uh, the chips that run computers, um, because of the fact that uh, all of the, co the co uh, computing chips that they're designing today have multiple cores on them, they would really like uh, computer science departments to start teaching how to program on multiple cores that run in parallel. Um, you know, it's all very well for them to say they would like us to do that, but I don't think anyone's actually come up with a really good curriculum to do it. And so um, it is something that actually I was just talking to Ron Lucas Hadas, who's the chair of the CS department at MUD about, and we think that we should actually have a better course on that, and we're thinking about how we're gonna get that developed. And one of the things we're possibly thinking about is having somebody from Intel actually come and spend a couple of years with us helping develop the curriculum and then sharing it with other places because, I mean, it's another great example of, um, yes, we need to make progress on it. It's probably gonna be a really big educational task to actually develop an excellent curriculum around that. And for places that are research intensive, their faculty probably aren't gonna invest the time into it. So, uh, so yes, I, I think, quoting Ron from earlier this week, he would say, we're not there yet, but it's something we have on our to-do list and something we want to pay attention to in the next couple of years. This will be our last question. Um, it was very interesting, your, your presentation was wonderful and it's very en enlightening seeing what the college has done to uh, get the disparity in their, their uh, student body a little bit more equalized. And I'm wondering how the culture shock and the culture change affected the uh, macho, uh, the, the macho type of uh, mentality and how that, uh, the interplay between um, how the female students were sort of being coddled along and pushed along and, and show, given a lot more opportunity. How did the male students react? 
great answer. I mean, great question. <laughs> Let's hope I, I can come up with a reasonable answer. No, excellent question. So I think the first thing is, you know, before, um, it used to be the case that there was a very strong computer culture, uh, computer major, computer science major culture in, in school that the faculty didn't particularly like. And it was very focused around gaming through all nights, all hours of the night, and you know, just being really very much like sort of the um, the stereotype that you have about nerds who have no life, etc. And um, and and I remember this by uh, talking to a couple of people who are graduating, uh, maybe in 2007 or something, and they, and or maybe they had graduated and they'd come back for a union. And I was talking to them about how many. CS majors were in their, female CS majors were in their class, and they said, oh, there's only one. And then another person said, no, actually, there was that, there was that girl, uh, you know, Annie or whatever. And, and then one said, oh, yeah, but she didn't really count because, yeah, she was a CS major, but she didn't hang out with us. So it was just a very tightly knit group. And now it's totally different. I mean, it's, it's like, and our faculty talk about the difference in teaching a class that is so much more vocal, more engaged, more articulate, more fun to work with. And, but we, it's not just that, we, we hear it from, for instance, one of our, our chemistry professors, VH, that uh, Kim knows, um, uh, he said to me, at the, and so he's class of, he's you know, from our first class, 61, and he's been a chemistry professor for, I don't know, at least four years. And he said to me last fall, he said, Marie, you have no idea how different things are with all of the women who we now have at lunch. I said, oh, tell me about it. He said, well, I'm teaching PCAM. And, um, you know, uh, I'm teaching the PCAM lab. And I started noticing that the students were dressing differently. I said, oh, what do you mean? And he says, well, one day they'd all come in red. And then the next day they'd all be in green. And then they showed up in ballroom attire. <laughs> and, and he says, I've just, it's like, you're having so many girls around, they care about this kind of stuff. And, and we hear from our clinic teams, which is our, you know, our team project that all engineers and computer scientists do, that now they dress up in these really fancy outfits for the presentations. I mean, it's just completely different. And I can tell you that the male students are so much happier. <laughs> I mean, everybody's happier. Uh, I mean, it's just, so I have had maybe two inquiries in the last six years from a male student. One was, how come males don't get to go to Hopper? And our answer is simply, you are the dominant group. And, you know, but if a male really wanted to go, we have taken male students to Hopper. And then another male student said, I didn't get a female, I did not get research experience at, after my first year, and I saw that eight female students did, and I think that's unfair. And I wrote back and said, the only reason we're able to do it for the females is that we actually got a research grant from the Baker Foundation that was explicitly aimed at female students. And, um, and we also had six male students, but because we had this specific grant for this, yeah, we just didn't have the same kind of resources. Now, I mean, I will tell you, mothers are the best people on the face of the earth. They are just really, really wonderful human beings. I mean, it's a very different culture from most places. It's not competitive. It's highly collaborative. It's all about helping others. And so, I, and I think the reaction from, from the male students, particularly those majoring in computer sciences, how great it is to have so many women in all the classes. So I have at other places run into some backlash, but not, not around that issue. I will say that the year we had 51.5% females in our income class, both male and female students were convinced we must have lowered the standards. How else could we have done it? And we had to explain to them that because our number of applications has doubled in the last five years, and because, you know, so we got 3,600 essentially applications this year. We're going to admit 600. Of those 3,600, there might be a thousand that are not admitted. So then you somehow have to, have to pick 
600 students out of 2,600 students who are amazing. And so if you have enough women in that component, of course you can admit 50. And that was the last question. <laughs> Thank you for joining us tonight. Have a safe trip home.